We've all heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. But how many times have you seen an image that actually fits that phrase? Not too many, I'm guessing. But today, that may change. My guest today is a visual storyteller from Texas, and we'll be discussing his image, Onto Your Shore. It's Paul Ernest on this episode of Behind the Shot. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to another episode of Behind the Shot. I'm your host, Steve Brazel. On this podcast, I try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots, from conception to completion, all those challenges and stories that happen in between. As always, this episode will have a blog post at thisweekinphoto.com. Make sure you head up there. You can find all the information about today's guest, a gallery of their work, and uh, links to find out more about them or to follow them on uh, social media if you'd like. Also, I'd like to suggest that you, instead of just watching it on YouTube or anything like that, start getting into podcasts a little bit. Get yourself a podcast player. Subscribe to the podcast either on the Google Play Store or on iTunes. And if you are a subscriber, I'd also like to ask that you please drop us a review. Hopefully you like the podcast. If there's something you'd like to suggest, you can always reach out to me on Twitter. I'm Raz2, R-A-Z-Z2. On Instagram, I'm Steve Brazel. And like I say, reach out to me, always open to suggestions. So that brings us up to today's episode. And on today's episode, I have a guest photographer that I've wanted to get on here for quite some time because um, there are so many people that take pictures and they're amazing, right? There's a lot of great photographers, but the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words is more than that. A picture is worth a thousand words is storytelling. And that's what our guest is today. Paul Ernst. Paul, welcome to the show, man. Hi, good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing really, really well. I really appreciate your joining me, especially since you're all the way over in uh, in Texas, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's jump into your background a little bit. Uh, just real mm -hmm. short, and we'll get right into this image. But uh, I made the comment about it storytelling when you, when you hear that phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. And you yeah. actually are branding yourself as a visual storyteller which yes. really, to me, fits what you do. But how did you come up with the idea of that as a brand for photography? Well, one of the things that uh, probably about oh, three and a half years ago, uh, I met a gentleman who did a lot of uh, consulting work with uh, a very famous painter. Um, uh, painted a lot of cottages. You probably know who he is. Uh, he said, he gave me several different pieces of criteria for building my brand, uh, in the area of art, but more so art, not in the fine art, uh, community, but more in a national brand type of approach. Uh, because I knew that I wanted my work to be more, uh, of, of a, uh, uh, I, I want my work to be in people's houses all across the United States. I don't want them to be just in art collector's homes. Right, right. And so some of the things that he shared with me, uh, uh, or some of the criteria that he shared with me, was uh, one of the primary things. He says, you have to come up with a description of who you are as an artist, but you can only use three words or less. So uh, uh, just like uh, Mark Twain said, if I'd had more time, I'd written a shorter speech. I labored over what to call myself for a while. And... It was actual, actually, my uh, son came up with the, the name. Uh, he said, well, why don't you just call yourself a visual storyteller? It, and it's so that was it fits. And, so. and when when viewers see more of your work, they're going to see one shot today. But when they go to the blog post mm -hmm. or they go visit your website, they'll understand even better how perfectly of a description that is to you. And mm -hmm. now your background, you have a BFA from the University mm -hmm. of, of North Texas, and your, mm -hmm. your background is really advertising design. Correct. Do yeah, you see I've that been, play a role in your pictures? Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, I think the reason being uh, uh, in, in that career, you have to tell a story, you have to present a message, and you have to do it quickly. And when I say quickly, uh, I can still remember projects where we would work on advertising campaigns that included billboards. You literally had to uh, 
hold your your design backwards and literally uh, turn it around for no more than two to three seconds and then turn it back around. And then the other people in the class had to uh, describe what they saw. And if they had no idea what you uh, what your message was, what your ad campaign is, what your brand was, you failed. So uh, I've always had this mindset of if you're going to say something, you have to say it strongly and you have to say it quickly. Um, otherwise, the, the viewer is going to miss it. So one of the early in my career, I was able to work with a studio called um, uh, David Carter Design Associates. So we got to work on projects like St. Andrew's Golf Course in Ireland. We got to work on uh, um, uh, the Bellagio in Las Vegas, Atlantis in the Bahamas, some really, really cool, uh, luxurious hotel and resorts. And so uh, I got to really uh, understand uh, what it was to not only uh, uh, involve the brand of what you're we're trying to to come up with a solution, you know, or, or a, a product to sell the client. But uh, you had to research who who is indigenous to those areas. What did they respond to? How could you tell the story of, of those people? When you're doing a project in South Africa, uh, uh, you you got to learn who your or learn learn what your background is, who the what the story is of the location. So that you can uh, evoke that in the brand, uh, because if you can't bring the the cu their customer, their eventual customer through that experience, um, then uh, it's not going to be a memorable. It's not going to be memorable, and it's not going to be something that they're going to be uh, enticed to want to go halfway across the world to go visit. So, so uh, in that, I just I I take a lot of the that training. Uh, with the work, I have to think very concisely. Um, in a lot of my presentations, uh, my, my platform classes, uh, I use an example of uh, uh, cinematography, which was one of my minors in college. Uh, in, in an average scene, you have a five minute scene in a movie. Uh, you're at 24 frames a second. You have 60 seconds in a, in a, a minute. And you have five minutes. You're over 9,000 frames to tell that story in that movie. I have one. And so that's, that's the kind of, of criteria that I have in front of me. So but what you're saying, it sounds like, is be, because of your design background, you understand the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you understand that you have to be succinct, like the movie example that you use in delivering exactly. the message that you want to do, which, uh -huh. which does show in, in your work. There's no question. Now, your first image... Um, mm -hmm. according to your website, at least, was 2009. So you've been doing this a while, but not, you know, the 20, 30 years like some people. And that image no. was called Chasing Butterflies. Mm -hmm. That's led you to the the series that you've released today and and a good amount of success, both commercially and, and in the industry. Like I met you at WPPI. You were a, an mm -hmm. image comp judge uh, mm -hmm. at WPPI. Um, I want to get into your image because mm -hmm. this image... In all honesty, it's it's like it really is like nothing I've seen anywhere else. It sounds it really sounds so you know unusual to say that because you everything's out there, right? This no. image isn't. Mm -hmm. So let me bring this up on screen, and I kind of want everybody to just kind of soak this in for a minute because this image, I was telling you off air, this image just has so much to me. So first of all, let, let's start at the beginning. The image has a name. What, what did you call this image? Onto Your Shore is the name of the image. Onto Your Shore. And you told me it was inspired by a song. It was. Uh, it was a song by the, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Garrison Keillor, uh, one of the most famous modern day uh, oral storytellers uh, around. And uh, he had an, uh, a group uh, by the name of the Wayland Jennies uh, on his show. And uh, I, I just fell in love with their music. And they have a song uh, that that line is in the song. Uh, and when I, when I listen to the song, my, my brain works a lot like a, a slideshow. 
And when I see my images, I see them very, very complete and I see them very uh, distinct. Uh, and um, I saw the image that you see on screen in my head when I heard that song. And this uh, detailed this detail. Now, the line you're talking about, the, by the way, um, yes, it's the Waylon Jennings. The mm -hmm. name of the song is Asleep at Last. Mm -hmm. And I listened to this song after you told me about it because I, I, you know, just the typical research stuff. Right. And instantly the line, pull my heart onto your shore. When I heard that line, my wife looked at this and said, what is she pulling? Mm -hmm. And I heard that line and it was like, oh, my gosh. It so makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and you pre-visualize the everything in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You have the, an unusual mind, young man. Well, I I think very metaphorically. I, I try to think of, and I think a part of that is the advertising background. You have to use metaphors uh, visually to deliver a message. You can't use words, obviously. Uh, you can't put a paragraph on a billboard and expect somebody to to read it in two seconds. So. I think a lot in metaphors and uh, I think a lot in, in duality. Uh, what kind of message can I convey on the uh, visually in the image that can be uh, used as an open ended um, statement, uh, an ellipses, if you will, for the viewer? How can they then take that thought and replace? Uh, my message or the outline of my story with their own story? How can they relate it to, to who they are? Because uh, I, I look at it this way. An artist and a viewer is, is a conversation, you know. Um, and many times the artist doesn't let the viewer get a word in edgewise in the conversation. What I try to do is, let, is make a statement and then let them talk, you know, or let them think. Um, you know, this image is very much uh, a metaphor. Uh, well, I, I'll give you an example. A lot of people who enjoy this image are uh, uh, wives of uh, military because uh, home is the center point for that, um, uh, for, for that soldier overseas. And so that... Uh, that rope is, in essence, the tether uh, to their commitment. And so as the song says, uh, be my anchor, be my moor, pull my, uh, pull my heart onto your shore. Uh, that is, the rope is their commitment. The uh, window is the unknown or the portal to the world outside of their home. And the anchor itself is the commitment of the person that you don't see. Okay, so I have to I have to ask you something then, because you, you with this being so well thought out, actually, mm -hmm. before I ask that question for the tech geeks out there, let's just get into some of the tech stuff. And then I'm going to come back to this this question about the model. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a Nikon shooter. Yes. And so I looked up the EXIF data on this. This is a Nikon D800. Is that your standard body? Uh, yeah, for the most part. Okay, uh, 24 to 70 lens, 24 to 70, 2.8 shot at 31 millimeters. Mm -hmm. um, ISO 1250, so a semi-dark room here at F4 and 1 80th of a second. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the EXIF data said that this was manual white balance. You manually set your white balance? You didn't set it in, in post shooting a raw image? Uh, I, I prefer uh, controlling my white balance, mainly because I shoot... Uh, uh, I, I like to shoot warm. Uh, uh, when you think about uh, the color of an image, uh, uh, it, it's hot and cold, uh, yellow or blue. Um, as human beings, we uh, we gravitate toward warmth. You know, when it's cold outside, we we want to go towards the the uh, uh, the fireplace. We want to gravitate toward warmth. So. Um, uh, visually, I use a lot of warmth in my images, and, and part of it too is my um, two of my biggest inspirations uh, are uh, uh, Norman Rockwell for his storytelling, uh, and um, uh, but probably bigger than that is Andrew Wyeth. Uh, Andrew Wyeth was actually 
coined as the surrealist realist. And uh, what that means is his images weren't just captures of, of rural everyday life. Uh, there was a sense of, of spirit about his images that left the viewer uh, uh, kind of beguiled as to what, what is really going on here? What is that, is that subject in the image? What are they thinking? Uh, he, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, is from Andy Wyeth, and he says, I often paint the most when I'm not painting. It's in the subconscious. And I, I think that what that means is um, he almost uh, mentally goes through the process of painting before he even picks up the paintbrush. Um, he, he tries to live in the moment of what he's trying to create um, rather than, uh, I think by the time he picked up the paintbrush, his image was basically already done mentally. Right, right, um, right. Whether consciously or subconsciously. Well, which and, is which is pre visualization from that type of art. Exactly. As well. Exactly. Um yep. so with this being manual white balance, mm -hmm. you kind of had it all pre visualized. You knew what you were doing, and now I want to get to that question that I had on the model. By the way, okay. do you know the model's name? Uh, Elizabeth. Okay. Because I want to give Elizabeth, you know, credit where credit is due, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um if you look at this model. Many, many photographers that I know would have coached her to do all kinds of things, not only this perfect pose with the back foot up, I love all of that, but they would have coached a facial expression. And you made the comment you like to let the viewers participate in the conversation. And now it makes huh? sense because her facial expression, not taking you to happiness or not taking you to sadness leaves that open to interpretation was that intentional mm -hmm. well let me give you an example I, I think in this situation um i think that i asked her to close her eyes because this image is, is probably five years old um i i said elizabeth i said close your eyes and think about what you love the most. Think about what you love, even as far as your childhood. What are the things that make you yearn? You know, what, uh, think about those things that are, that run so deep for you that, that you can't even find words for them. And as you close your eyes, I want you to think about those things. And that's a skill, by the way, that so mm -hmm. many photographers, they try and pose every, every facial muscle. Mm -hmm. And you instead brought out a natural exactly. pose. Now, this shot, is this is a composite? It is not a composite. This was shot as I'm looking at it. Mm -hmm. You had an yep. anchor and a rope. Really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I had all kinds of questions of, you know, how did you light the model in the studio versus versus the uh, the background location? This is mm -hmm. this is so amazingly lit. Is there is that natural light coming through the window or is that artificial? It is artificial. Basically, what I did is I used a, a quartz uh, light um, or a halogen, I guess, is another word for it. Um, I think it was a, oh gosh, maybe a 500 watt light. Um, very, very, very warm light uh, in terms of temperature. Uh, so, but not a hot careful. light. It's it's a flash. No, it's a it's a hot light. So yeah, it's a it's solid a, it's on a, light. Yeah, it's a quartz uh, halogen hot light or or constant light. Okay. And it 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 is a. a by its uh, its Kelvin is is already very warm. So I uh, the difference between for me constant lights are warmer, uh, flashes are obviously cooler. So I didn't really have to do much to the to the color temperature on this image um, in order to to get it uh, you know where I wanted it. Uh, but one thing I did do is uh, I put um, a piece of ripstop nylon um, 
uh, just like what you see on a soft box. You can buy that at the fabric store uh, uh, by the yard. So I bought a couple of yards of that, and I just tape it over the outside of that window with gaffer's tape. Oh. And that's what creates the soft light. Uh, uh, the, you made, if you, you notice, turned the window uh, into a soft box? Correct. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. But what I, I think there's, there was, I think I actually, I did do multiple exposures on this image. Um, I used the, the ripstop over the window to create the softness on her face but then i took it off uh to get to get the slight um outline of the uh window um on the wall uh behind her right um if you notice you barely see kind of the make out the 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 rectangular shape of the window on the wall behind her um i think i had taken the ripstop off uh, rip stop off at that point shot it again so i got a little bit more of a distinct outline of that window now if i had used a flash uh, on this image uh this would have given me a very very hard shape to that light source on that back uh, wall um that's the other thing i like about constant lights is that it i can control uh elements like that in this particular uh environment I've got other images, um, uh, such as Living Within, uh, which is the woman uh, seated uh, uh, facing away from the window with an Edison bulb light hanging from a, a cord uh, with a jar of, uh, of uh, uh, fireflies in front of her. That, I used a flash, and I did not use any ripstop nylon, so I had that very distinct shape of the window on that wall. Right, So. Right. I, I that's how I kind of control the 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 light and the shapes uh, that the light creates. This, in this was room. this was just one light. This was just one light. Okay, and so this was on location. Uh, interesting room to be shooting in. Did you do any unusual? I mean, other than the normal post, um, did you do any unusual post production on this shot? Uh, I do add uh, some noise to the image. I also. Um, uh, add a little bit of an HDR effect. Um, okay. I do a little bit of extra sharpening. Um, and then I have uh, a texture treatment that uh, is very uh, reminiscent of a crosshatch, you know, pattern. Right. Uh, or that of Andrew Wyeth uh, that I'll, uh, I'll do on it as well. And, you know, and that's that kind of a effect. common theme in a lot of your images, that texture type of overlay. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you overlay that in Photoshop? I do. Yeah. Okay. And it's You're, a multi-layer process. I use three to four layers. Of the, uh, of the texture? Yeah. You, are you 100% Photoshop or do you use Lightroom or something too? A, a Photoshop. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things I noticed in this image that I just have to point out that, because that, again, I met you at WPPI and you were there judging image competition. And mm -hmm. when I saw this image, there's a couple things that leaped out at me that just make it so strong. The image mm -hmm. is right heavy. So yes, she is not on a rule of third. In fact, she's right of the right rule of third, which is is theoretically dangerous, putting her that close to the edge. Also, under the window are all the leaves and the dirt and the the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you have the back window, the 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 boarded up window, dead center. Mm -hmm. The anchor and rope, dead center, and the left side is dark and basically, for lack of a better phrase you know, white space, right? Blank space. Uh -huh. um, that puts a heavy emphasis on where she's pulling an anchor in and pulling on a rope, which mm -hmm. just further emphasizes what she's doing in, in, mm -hmm. in a, uh, it's not even, I, I want to say subtle only no. because most people wouldn't think of it. Right. But it's not that subtle. Um, how heavy this image is to the right, which really, really makes it work. I, I love this shot, man. I just, mm -hmm. It's one of the most unique, beautifully done shots I've seen. Well, thank you. Um, the, the reason for the negative space is uh, uh, basically the, the subject that's not present in the image. So the weight of that empty space is the weight of the person that she's missing. If people want to see more of you know, Paul Ernest's work, 
Uh, you have two different websites. What are they? Uh, I have uh, paulernest.com. Uh, that is going to be my fine art work, uh, more of just a, an online gallery, you know, a visual gallery. Uh, and uh, I have, um, uh, there's a link on there to um, uh, visualstorytellerdesigns.com, which is our new retail website of all of the different products that I've created. Um, I... Back when I was in college, I, I considered going into um, uh, interior design. And so in the process of coming up with this style and, and all the different images, and I have over 100 images. Uh, I have uh, five different presentation styles uh, in three or four sizes. So uh, mathematically, I have over 1,400 combinations of the way my images are, are presented. And um, I think a lot of that is due to an influence of uh, the interior designer that worked on this uh, restaurant. He really pushed me to think about my images in a, a mixed media presentation. And um, so uh, the, the website is uh, uh, visualstorytellerdesigns.com and then my, uh, my artist site, which is paulernest.com. And then social media-wise... You're on Twitter at Paul Ernest, Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram both are Paul Ernest visual storyteller. So if you want to know more about Paul Ernest, which I highly recommend, mm -hmm. go to paulernest.com and just kind of browse through his gallery because oh. um, there is some really amazing, amazing artwork. And again, visual storytelling. And more importantly to me, um, from an art point of view, amazing inspiration that he's got on his site with his work. So Paul, thank you very much for joining us on behind the shot today. I appreciate it, buddy. You are very welcome. Um, by the way, I wanted to share with you. Uh, I'm also doing a Kickstarter campaign. Um, I, I, since I now have as many images as I, as I have, uh, working on these since 2009, um, uh, it's actually been a dream of mine for the last couple of years to do a coffee table book of all of the images. Um, I've kind of written little short stories uh, or outlines of what the images mean to me, the story that it evokes. Um, so what we've done is the, the book is going to be uh, a hardbound um, uh, uh, or hard hardcover coffee table book. We'll have both a, a standard edition and a limited edition. Uh, leather bound limited edition it'll be about 240 pages uh, but it'll have the images it'll have the stories but it's also going to have uh, uh, additional notes in the back some of the images have had some very very um, surreal uh, and for me life-changing experiences that I also want to share uh, in addition uh, to the to the overall artist message of the image and uh, what I'm hoping for this, this book is that um, the Kickstarter campaign is successful and that uh, it allows me to print these so that uh, people can have them in their homes as a, a tool for them to share their stories with their friends and family. Uh, I want this to be a, a catalyst for them to be able to, um, uh, to carry on a... a uh, that uh, uh, oral storytelling uh, in their own homes. Uh, that is so important that we continue that, that, that heritage and that legacy. Um, I still, growing up with my, my grandparents, um, some of my fondest, fond, fondest memories growing up are uh, the stories that my grandparents would tell me, stories that my great-grandparents would tell me. And I have the luxury of telling those stories to my kids today. Um, and uh, I, I just, I want this to be something that allows other people to do the same in their homes. Right. That, I, I look forward to seeing what this book look, looks like when it's done. We'll make sure and take the, uh, the Kickstarter link. And uh, we'll either overlay it over the video here in, in editing or we'll make sure for sure that it is on the blog post, thisweekinphoto.com, 
Go to Behind the Shot, and uh, we'll make sure that the blog post for this episode with Paul has the Kickstarter link. And I can't stress enough, uh, make sure that you support this book because Paul is just an amazing visual artist and visual storyteller. So like I said before, thank you very much for joining me. That does it again for another episode of Behind the Shot. Join us next time when we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind their shot. Mm -hmm.